All right, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Wednesday Night Live Bible Study. And tonight we're looking at uh, the pastoral letters of First and Second Timothy. Um, so let's have a word of prayer and then I'll share my screen and we'll jump right into it. Mighty God, thank you for this 23rd day of February and the year of our Lord, 2022. Thank you for gathering us together to learn from one another, to learn with one another. Uh, make your presence known as we study because we want to not just know about you, but we want to grow in our relationship with you. So bless our time here together this evening. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Um, so, as always, um, what we're doing here is really just highlighting a few key points of each chapter. Um, but let me uh, tell you a little something about Timothy. So, and Titus and Spielbrom, were serving in pastoral roles in local congregations. So they're called the pastoral letters. Uh, these protégés of Paul are leading congregations in the Mediterranean world. And the letters mark the beginning of organizational structure in the church. So we hear talk about elders, bishops, deacons, um, that we don't get in a lot of in other books. So uh, because the church had grown and spread beyond Jerusalem, now we're starting to get some organizational structure. I don't want you to think that the church was completely institutionalized because it was far from it, but we're beginning to see um, some kind of structure. So the first letter written to Timothy, uh, of course, was by the Apostle Paul, although many believe that it was written by a disciple of Paul. And it's believed to have been written around 63 AD when he was in Macedonia. And the recipient, recipient is Timothy. So unlike letters to Rome, the Ro uh, Romans or Ephesus or Colossians that was written to a faith community, this letter is written to a person, and that person is Timothy, Paul's protege. Uh, it was his son in the ministry, and he was, Timothy was ministering in Ephesus. And uh, eventually, church history teaches that Timothy became the bishop uh, in Ephesus. So the purpose of uh, this letter is to instruct Timothy in his pastoral responsibilities. Paul warns, well, let me say this. So Paul teaches about prayer, worship, and church leadership, but he warns against heresy. Now, this is what both of the letters are primarily about, heresy, which is teaching against doctrine. So that's what we're dealing with in these two letters. I see a hand raised. Is there a question? Yes, Pastor, I'm sorry. Could you just say another word or two why it's believed, why some believe the letters were not written, this letter was not written by Paul? Um, What's that based on? Well, sometimes it's just the writing style that may have been different or because of when it was written and Paul may have be been believed to be doing something else. But I it, thought it, that, it, I, excuse me, I thought that was interesting coming. I don't want to belabor it. Because when I read Timothy 1 and 2, and especially in 1, I thought this is different, a little different than Paul. So that's why that point caught my attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But in essence, it would have been. So what they did in the ancient world, and it's not just in the Bible, if you were writing on behalf or you were writing the thought of someone else, that you would attach their name to it because their name may have had more credibility. So while Paul, it's debated whether he literally wrote this, 
uh, it still would have been something that came about from his teaching. But uh, perhaps the writing style is a little different than what Paul would have done. So first chapter of Timothy. Uh, we're going to try to move quickly because we're doing two books and uh, the summary videos are, are should have been done together, but they seem kind of long. So according to Paul, love comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and sincere faith. And Paul explains the law was made for lawbreakers and rebels and and whatever goes against sound doctrine or rebels and whatever goes against sound doctrine. So my, my question is, what is the difference between belief and doctrine? Keep in mind, this is the primary purpose of both of Paul's letter, dealing with false teachers, dealing with doctrine, dealing with heresy, all, all, uh, all the same thing. But just so we're clear, what is the difference between doctrine and belief? As Paul lifts up the word doctrine can unmute or put it in the chat. Someone speaking? No? Could it be because um, the belief can be something to do with your culture? Could it be because um, the belief can be You said belief could do something with the culture. Your culture, you know. And then the doctrine will be things that are Credible and um, they are like academically proven or something proven on your culture. I don't yeah, know. I think you're on, on track. So belief doesn't necessarily have to be wrong. It could be correct. And of course, most belief, most of what we believe is based on our culture. But yeah, the doctrine would be considered um, what is widely accepted. So when Paul is talking doctrine, he's probably talking about something the apostles agree on, that this has been, whatever this thought is, whatever this belief is, it is widely accepted by the authority. So it's official belief, whereas belief isn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but it's not official belief of the church. So what Paul is saying is that these people who are talking, and again, we're dealing with Gnostics, We've talked about them in the past. This was a threat in early, in the early church in Ephesus and would later become an, uh, a threat to uh, more than just Ephesus, the church in general. So what Paul is saying that these people are teaching is something that goes against what the apostles have officially said is true and what we believe. So again, belief it doesn't, doesn't mean that it's wrong. It's just... It's not something that is official. Like um, um, traditionally in my country, my culture is that it's fading away. We are preaching against it. We are educating people against it, but we did it before. Like when somebody dies on the third day, the seventh day and the 40th day, we dig hole in the front yard and then we will make a procession to that hole and put food, every item that we, every food that we have cooked for that day to commemorate that day, we will put it in the hole and we will be praying to them, you know, mm -hmm. with the belief that they will come there at night and whatever and come with their friends. So they will tell you, put a lot, they might be coming with, and they will calling all the other relatives that have died. <laughs> they will mm -hmm. come with them to come and eat. That was a belief, that was a belief but then we look at it and we, this is like pagan worshiping. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. that's, yep. a, that's an interesting tradition. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, all right. Still in first chapter of first Timothy, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. If you've been in the church, you've heard that before. Paul believes that he was the worst sinner, but has been shown mercy. And of course, he thinks he's the worst sinner because he once persecuted Christians, the very group that he's a part of. And uh, Paul says that some of his companions got caught up in some sort of sin. And Paul says he handed them over to Satan. What do you think that means, that he handed them over to Satan?
Well, I think that 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 maybe it means that he um, with he withdrew their membership from from the congregation that he had formed there and that they were like banned. Yeah, I, I think it, so. Um, I'm using the King James uh, translation in Romans where it talks about a reprobate mind. So I think what, what's happening here is Paul, these, these people, whoever these two men, I think he names, are caught up in a sin. Not that they have sin, but they're caught up in some sort of sin. And so Paul uh, turns them over to that sin saying, okay, uh, I can't bring you out. So um, whatever sin has caught you up, it will become your punishment. And the reason perhaps the, uh, Satan is used because Satan being the king of temptation and whatever these men are caught in is um, ultimately they would believe came from Satan because we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with powers and principalities. So I, I don't, I don't know that Paul is saying that literally, but whatever they're caught up in, they're turned over to. And uh, that becomes sort of their prison. But hopefully they find their way out. All right, going to chapter two. Uh, Paul urges prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone. And then something um, that is interesting in uh, second, uh, first Timothy chapter two says, God, our savior wants all people to be saved. So my question is, if God wants all people to be saved, will all people be saved? If God wants no. it. <laughs> You say no. So God wants it, but God won't make it happen. We have free will. But isn't God smarter than our free will? Yes. Yes, but he lets us do what we do. Thy will be done. <laughs> couldn't God let us do what we want to do and still outsmart us so that all people are saved? Yes, he does, Pastor, because he says that he tells us how we can get away from sin. We sin against him, but he shows us the way how to get away from it. So he can use that and pour that wisdom into us, because when the wisdom of God pours into you, it's like an anointing, and you will be able to change. People can change even at the last moment so that he will not lose anyone. Even like it was on the cross the day when Christ died, when he saved the, 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 the thief who said, please remain. Uh, yes. Uh, just, just a quick question. Is this a differentiation between God's will and God's want? Because God, God's will is that which he decides is going to happen. But God wants a lot of things, but it's not necessarily God's will. I guess he left that up to us when he but gave us, us free will. Yeah, but ultimately, what God wants will. I, I, you know what I'm saying? If, if in the end of the universe, the end of time, God wants it, then I would think it will be done. Just put a pin in it. Think about it. Well, we haven't come to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, which is pretty interesting. So still in chapter 2, Jesus is the mediator between God and humanity. Paul says that women should not teach or have authority over men. Anybody have any idea why? No, we can probably say the culture. It's, it's pretty interesting what was going on in, in Ephesus. So women aren't supposed to teach and women aren't supposed to have authority is what Paul says. Although many say the word authority is a bad translation. 
um, that some would argue that the word, the real word is dominance. You should not have dominance. Um, but well, along with, yes, go ahead. I was just saying, Pastor, it seems like uh, he used, and I'm not looking at the wording right now, but it seems like he used, used as an example that Adam was first and that, you know, Eve was taken from Adam, Adam's rib, and Eve was the real sinner, the first sinner. So, I mean, yeah, he I'll, used a kind of interesting logic to me, but, you know. Yeah, I, well, keep in mind, he's, he's writing to a specific culture because we know that the real culprit was Adam. Because if we go back and read Genesis, God didn't tell Eve not to eat from the tree of good and knowledge. God told Adam. So Adam had to be the violator. But, um, and if you read uh, the story of Adam and Eve figuratively, which some do, or allegorically, that God created human, as in man. Some people still use that word today, man, when referring to human beings. And then God put human, this human being into a deep sleep and separated, and there became man and woman. One understanding, but so what was going on in Ephesus? Not only did you have the Gnostics, but you had this all women led cult of Artemis. Artemis, Greek goddess of hunting and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Victory, Nike, she's the Nike lady. So um, the this group of women who were a part of the religion or cult, whatever you want to call it, of Artemis, found their way into the church in, in Ephesus. So when Paul starts talking about women keep silent, women not having authority, he's really addressing this group of Artemis worshipers who were teaching things about Artemis that had nothing to do with Jesus. Now, of course, this scripture is used by many to say, you know, God doesn't call women into ministry, but I would always uh, point to the fact that this letter was written not to a church, not to every church, it was written to Timothy, who was dealing with certain issues in Ephesus. One of them was this cult of Artemis that was led by all women. So that is perhaps what Paul is dealing with, not saying that women can't teach because all we have to do is go and read the book of Acts, read Romans and other letters um, where Paul did have women a part of his ministry. In fact, as we highlighted in, in the book of Romans chapter 16, Paul refers to a woman as an apostle. So keep in mind, this was addressing a specific issue, which is funny, people bring this up, but don't bring up the fact uh, where it talks about how to wear your hair, not to wear your jewelry, yeah. and all of these things. <clears throat> uh, I, 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 I've probably said this before, but I, I wanna highlight, if you read the Bible literally, you're gonna, it, it, you're gonna run into a whole lot of challenges. Um, but there are some things that uh, we like to highlight and others we don't. Uh, Paul was really dealing with extravagance and people who um, were flaunting because to wear your hair in a certain way meant that you had servants to make it up for you or to, to, to this jewelry. And so he wasn't against those things, but this was being flaunted in the congregation. And so he was really addressing that issue. Any thoughts or comments before we move to chapter three? I right. know that women have, have a great control over the influence of what happens within their communities. Because I know many um, practices that are being prohibited right now in Africa, like female genital mutilation and all the other things, even marriage, um, is, these are all issues that are raised by women. The men don't, I'm not bringing them down in any way or belittling men, but men don't sit and consider this little, little trivial things that women um, do. It's the women who would tell their husband, 
Do you see? She's grown now. She's reached puberty. We should get a husband. And they are the ones who bring up the conversation in Africa. And mm -hmm. I know that like the saying say goes, you, you educate a woman, you educate a village. It's true. Whatever you teach a woman, that's why it's good to teach like good things, good qualities, um, things that women can promote. They can promote things, men can't. Mm -hmm. and, and we see what, even though that women, uh, Paul addresses this issue with women that many people take out of context, uh, there are women in the congregation being taught by Timothy, which at that time would have gone been counterculture. So we know Paul wasn't against, was against some of the norms of society at that time because he had no problem with women being taught and in ministry as we see it in other places. And then perhaps the most uh, vital scripture is when Paul says um, there's no Jew nor Greek, uh, no Gentile, no slave, no free, no male, no female in Christ Jesus. There's no such thing as those um, things that separate us. All right, 1 Timothy chapter 3, an overseer, or your translation may say bishop. That's what bishop means, overseer. It's the exact same thing. So an overseer must be above reproach, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, a teacher, and manage his family well, and it says, and uh, married to one woman. Overseers must be thought of well by outsiders. So I can see why it's important for the bishop to be thought of well by the congregation, but why, why does the bishop need to be thought of in high regards by outsiders, those who are not a part of the church? It would, uh, <clears throat> could hurt the reputation of the church if the leader, the bishop, was not seen as having these uh, good qualities and characteristics, even to those outside the church. Yeah, it was, it's, it's really just a practical thing. If the head of the church in this area is not respected, then the people don't respect the church. And so uh, the bishop or overseer has to uh, have a good standing in the community, be well respected. If so, then the church could be real, well respected. Because remember, this is a new thing, this thing called the church. Um, people have never heard of it because it didn't exist prior to this time. So um, there it's is important. Pastor, may I, may I ask a question? Yes. So in the, according to the scripture, it appears that Paul is concerned with the bishops falling into uh, the snare of the devil. And that is the reasoning that he gives for them being um, that they should be of a certain age, so they shouldn't be puffed up <laughs> and therefore fall into the snare of the devil. And, and then he goes on to say that they must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I guess it makes me think that, I mean, this is modern day thinking, that the bishop needs to avoid any improprieties because those improprieties may well get him caught up in sinful behaviors. Yes. Yeah, and it was important for the bishop, as you said, to stay out of that, out of mess. Because keep in mind, just in the church, that's what, what Timothy is dealing with in the church in Ephesus. He's dealing with Gnostics, these false teachers, and he's dealing with these Artemis worshipers. And so if you're uh, looking at the qualifications, it says should not be a new convert. So it can't be someone new to the faith, it has to be someone experienced because they're gonna be up against quite a bit. All right, still in chapter three, then Paul leaves from talking about overseers to deacons and deacons must hold uh, the office uh, of deep truths of the faith. So they must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith. 
says women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious, but temperate and trustworthy. And deacons who serve well gain an excellent standing. So um, a lot of people don't know this, but you know, you hear deacons like in some of the congregational churches like Baptist, but in the United Methodist Church, we actually have deacons. Um, but in the United Methodist Church, deacons are ordained. They're seminary trained and ordained. And they serve in the church um, in a number of ways. More often than not, deacons don't serve as pastors. They serve in uh, some other capacity, which is what a deacon is, serve, means to serve. So it really connects the church to uh, the outside world. Uh, Jamil Hendricks um, has gone the route of deacon. Uh, you all may know Jamil, who grew up in the church and graduated from St. James. Uh, so we have elders, we have deacons, and then we have overseers, and overseers are just, not just, they're elders who have been elevated to the status of bishop. All right, chapter four, First Timothy. Some will abandon the faith by following deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. So what Paul is saying that these Artemis worshipers and these uh, Gnostics that he, he sees everything black and white. So these folk are teaching things that are coming from demons. So Timothy should train himself to be godly because godliness holds benefits for this life and the life to come. And Paul declares that God is the savior of all people. Uh, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, it's an interesting uh, verse because it says that God is, is the savior of all people, especially those who follow Jesus, depending on your translation. Um, so in reading that, uh, if I'm reading from the NIV, it says that that is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is savior of all people and especially those who believe. So in that verse, it can be easily interpreted that God saves all people, but in particular, those who believe, which is why I asked the question earlier, if God wants all people saved, will all people be saved? Uh, just to, something to think about, we'll move on. Chapter five, first Timothy. Older men should be treated as fathers, older women as mothers, younger men should be treated as brothers, and younger women as sisters. So basically, in the church, everyone's to be treated as family. Mm -hmm. And then Paul deals with something about the widows. Those who fail to provide for their relatives are worse than unbelievers. And Paul makes this deal about real widows um, or true widows. Um, it, it, it's almost as if he says if they're elderly widows, then they ought to be taken care of by their family. But if they're younger widows, then maybe they ought to go ahead and get married because they might get caught up in some stuff <laughs> is basically what Paul is saying. Uh, all right. First Timothy. So uh, here's the quote. The real widow left alone has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But the widow who lives her pleasure is dead even while she lives. So that's where he's dealing with the younger widows. Excuse me, ought to go ahead and get, um, perhaps ought to marry again, but the older widows focus on their relationship with God. And, and that's the birth of polygamy in the Islam religion. The reason why they had to marry more than one wife was that um, they were asked if they can be able to financially support, but then this younger women were um, being given opportunity to remarry because their husband had died in a jihad and they um, were very young and they were obligated to get married again, even if it is to the brother of their husband. Yeah. 
And there were some, even some Christian sects that did the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so Paul, apparently Timothy's having some issues with his stomach. So Paul urges him to drink a little wine for the sake of his stomach and frequent illnesses. Chapter six of 1 Timothy. Those who are under the yoke of slavery should consider their masters worthy of full respect. Now, of course, this is a troubling passage for some, just like the whole issue with women. But looking at the cultural context, slavery was not the same institution that it was in North America. So it's believed that if these masters are believers, then they'll treat their slaves with respect. Um, just the, the, the culture of that time. And then in 1 Timothy, we find a passage of scripture that's often quoted, but it's quoted wrong because people quote the King James Version. And the King James Version says, the love of money is the root of all evil, which makes absolutely no sense at all. The proper translation is that love of money is a root to all kinds of evil. So just quickly, just say it, name it out there, because we're we still have a ways to go. What are some of the evils that are produced as a result of the love of money? Um, Envy, greed. Envy, greed. Seriously, murder. There, there, murder has happened as a result of. The love of money, jealousy, fever, theft, theft, envy. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you can see how the love of money can lead to all kinds of evil. So, that is First Timothy chapter six. Uh, no one has ever seen the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and godless chatter and false knowledge have caused some to wander. Paul is constantly dealing with this false teaching in both of these letters. So that's 1 Timothy. And just a few lessons from 1 Timothy is members of the household of faith should treat one another like family. The elder men, fathers, elder women, mothers, other men and women, brothers and sisters. Uh, false information can lead you astray, and the love of money can lead to evil behavior. All right, we're going to go to 2 Timothy. Now, this second letter, uh, Paul is credited with writing uh, to Timothy, and it's believed that he wrote it in 66 AD, so roughly three years after the first letter, and while he was perhaps imprisoned in Rome. And the purpose of this letter is uh, still the same. He's encouraging Timothy as Timothy is experiencing uh, conflict in Ephesus, and the conflict is dealing with these false teachers. So in 2 Timothy, Paul addresses Timothy's faith and pastoral responsibilities. And he deals with the essence of pastoral ministry and opposition to heresy and instructions on sound doctrine. So in the first chapter of 2 Timothy, Paul believes he's been appointed a herald, an apostle, and teacher. And he charges Timothy to guard the good treasure entrusted with him. So what might the good treasure that Timothy's been entrusted with be? What is this good treasure? Is the NRC I, thought the gospel, I thought it was the gospel according to Jesus Christ. Basically, the simple answer, yes. That's what I mean. Paul shared it with Timothy, so he's been entrusted with this treasure that has benefits, blessings for those who hear it and receive it. And so Paul wants him to guard it because there are those who are taking it 
and distorting it, i.e. the Gnostics and this Artemis cult. Paul has had some of his friends turn away from him in Asia. So Paul's lost some friends while he's been in ministry, which, you know, is nothing new to Paul because he's so bold and uh, preaches what he believes. So he's had some friends turn away from him, um, most notably because of all the legal problems that Paul has gotten into, all his arrests and beatings. And some say, hey, that's enough for me. Onesiphorus is not ashamed of Paul's chain. So Paul does have a friend of his who doesn't care that he's in prison in Rome. He even searched Paul out while he was in Rome. So while some have abandoned Paul, just the same way that Jesus was abandoned, some uh, have stuck around to help Paul and minister to him. Paul encourages Timothy to be strong in grace that is in Christ Jesus. And some are claiming that the resurrection has already taken place. Of course, this was a part of the false doctrine uh, that was being taught. So it's not the resurrection of Jesus. They're saying the resurrection of all people has already taken place. And this would have been something that the Gnostics would teach because the Gnostics believe that only people, some certain people have special knowledge and they are saved and resurrected as a result of this special knowledge. And so, uh, of course, uh, Paul has to teach against that and he wants Timothy to make sure that, um, that that kind of stuff isn't being taught. Uh, he continues on, foolish and stupid arguments produce quarrels. It led me to ask the question, what are some foolish arguments that people have in the church? What are, what are some of the foolish things that modern day church folk debate and argue about? Uh, whether we need to say the Apostles Creed every Sunday in church, I guess that argument is over. Uh, what, uh, you know, what people should wear to church, what's, what's appropriate attire, who should be in charge of different things within the church. And also uh, petty arguments like, that is my seat, this is where I sit. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that is, uh, yes, that is, those, those are foolish arguments. The, the music in the church, there are arguments about whether we should have more anthems or whether we should uh, not play so much gospel or it may not be just, it may not be as much of an argument as it is a grumbling among members. Yeah, I think... Yeah, although it, the argument of music has happened and uh, probably 99.9% .9 of churches have had those uh, arguments, um, I, I, I do see the value in it because music speaks to us and different types of music speaks to different types of people. Um, and of course, today, uh, the, the kind of music that people appreciate vary. I, I remember um, Bishop, um, of course, I forgot his name. He was our bishop here in Missouri for 12 years. Um, Schnazy, Robert Schnazy, used to always say, 100 years ago, you could have four generations in the church and they would all appreciate the same church music. Well, today, if you have four generations, you have probably 12 different tastes in music. Uh, so it varies. And so uh, it is a debate in churches. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I understand, I understand that more than uh, what to wear. I don't understand that argument, why that would be a debate, why, what somebody wears. I uh, don't understand about the pews. And I'm looking on Facebook and arguing about whether you give based off gross or net. I have heard that argument as well. 
<laughs> uh, arguing about gross or net. Um, we also I have my argue, own take. We also argue uh, about how the money is spent. Yes. People want to know. I remember one meeting we had when someone someone asked how much money we were paying the musicians and how much money we were spending on toilet paper. I mean, oh people get toilet into paper. the weeds about in churches about how money is spent. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I, I understand that argument. Not down to the toilet paper. I don't understand that one. Uh, but yeah, I do. Uh, because people want to make sure that the church being a good steward of their finances, but some of the, argue, the debates or discussion can become foolish. Uh, so yes, we do have still foolish arguments in the church, in the modern church. So um, I don't know if it's good or bad that it's always been around, but we know it's still around. A pastor, the church is full of humans. Yes. So it's inevitable that they're, I mean, we're not uh, homogeneous in our thinking and our, um, in our walk even. So I, I agree. We, we can expect that there will be arguments. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I always say, you know, people talk about, you know, they, they leave the church, not just a congregation, but the church, because they say the church is full of hypocrites and my argument is always name an institution that humans are a part of where everything is perfect. And, and there is, it doesn't exist because as long as there are humans, we're going to have error. We're going to have faults. We're going to have problems because we are fallen creatures. All right. Uh, let me look in the chat. Of course, none of that goes on at St. James. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> All right. We'll move on to chapter three. Paul says there will be chaos and people will do all sorts of sinful things in the last days. Uh, you know, because of uh, what Paul put in Second Timothy, people are always... I always hear people say, well, you know, we're in the last days, just read the Bible. And what my response is always, yes, we've been in the last days for the last 2000 years. And it is useless to try to look at the sign of the time to say, okay, the end is about to come. In addition to the fact that Jesus says no one knows. So why waste time trying to figure it out? Just spend every life, every day as if it's the end. The Lord rescued Paul from persecutions and suffering. And everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So do you think this statement is universal or is it contextual? That everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So, I think, uh, in, in, of course, in some parts of the world, different religions are persecuted, including Christians. But I think it may be more, uh, I think it still happens maybe more figuratively, saying that the, the road to Christ is narrow. And so the persecution is more like all the things we, we can't do, we're not supposed to do, you know, do evil to no one and forgive those who wrong you not exactly a persecution but it's a it's a hard road to travel mm -hmm. yeah it, it's hard to say that christians in the united states are persecuted there are some parts of the world um but not everyone there was a, a uh, discussion in uh, the lee summit school district where in the schools, there's a safe zone for LGBTQ students. And there was a Christian group that opposed it, said that we need a safe zone for Christians, which is ridiculous because if there's one group that's not persecuted in the United States, it's Christians. 
uh, we might argue uh, amongst each other, but I don't, I can't ha call that persecution. Um, yes, I would say we do struggle trying to live the life that Jesus set out for us to follow. It's, it is a struggle, but I don't know that we're being persecuted in this country. I don't know that persecution would be the word that I would uh, think of today more so than suffering or, um, oh, I had another word that, that came to mind. Uh, but Paul did use a lot in this, in Second Tim Timothy, he did use the word suffering a whole lot in this particular letter, which caught me. But I think um, any, anyone who wants to live a real Christian life uh, may, I want to say, suffer from some negative response because they're trying to be Christians. Yeah. So maybe not persecuted by walking the straight and narrow according to Jesus Christ may cause some suffering in some way. Suffering is a little heavy too, but yeah. there a backlash. I can't think of a good word here. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with the suffering more so than the persecution. I think this persecution, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, might be addressing what was going on in Ephesus. I don't think it addresses everywhere. Um, but yes, I, I think uh, trials, everyone will go through um, and, and suffering because we can't think of another word instead of suffering. <laughs> All right, the last chapter of these letters to Timothy. Christ Jesus will judge the living and the dead. We heard that in, our, um, in the Apostles' Creed. Uh, Paul encourages Timothy to preach the gospel in all seasons and in all places. Paul declares that his time is short, but he has fought the good fight and finished the race. So it's almost as if Paul is, it, it almost senses the end of his life is near. Of course, he would be executed, um, but I think he senses it because he says his time is short. So he knows that if he continues what he's doing, that sooner or later, he'll be executed. And there have already been attempts. Uh, Paul encourages Timothy to come visit him in Ephesus and he or come visit him in Rome. And Paul sends greetings to uh, the others in Ephesus. Any thoughts, comments, questions about these two letters that Paul wrote? to his young protege, Timothy. Well, well to me, the, the reading Paul's writings reminds me, what, it makes me think about the difficulty with the Bible and that a lot of times a person like Paul is writing to someone, to that audience in that context, in that time in history, whereas it, he, for us in the present and in, in the future or in the present, we get meaning out of it for our own lives. But on the other hand, sometimes we can turn that into the law or our doctrine or what. I don't know if that, that's the right word, but it's like we want to make it into uh, something that it isn't necessarily. Although we can still get a lot of per meaning out of it. Um, so it's kind of a difficulty with the Bible, I think, if you ask me. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right. And, and Timothy... It does teach all scripture is useful and helpful. We do read that in Paul's writings to Timothy. And I believe that the Holy Spirit inspired all scripture and the Holy Spirit uses scripture today and all of it is relevant and meaningful for teaching. But we do have to read it with an understanding that it was not written to and for people living in the United States in the year 2022. And if we read it as if it was written, written to people in the United States in the 21st century, there are several things that we won't understand or distort 
because it was written to a completely different culture, completely different time, completely different part of the world. But there are lessons in it if we understand what is at the heart of being taught. Um, all right, I'm reading the chat. Given all the talk about women in Timothy, I thought some might appreciate this. Three wise women would have arrived on time, helped deliver the baby, cleaned the stable, made a casserole, brought practical gifts, and there would be peace on earth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, Pat, your last statement is, is for me uh, very important because for me, reading the Bible uh, and trying to keep it in context is, is one aspect, but drawing from the Bible what you need in order to live a Christian life and what is quote unquote true becomes another set of circumstances. So, you know, I guess the real challenge is when to read it literally, figuratively, or a message that goes beyond the time. Yeah, uh, and it just requires constant prayer and study. Um, you know, I, I think it's important for people to understand the cultural context behind uh, the scripture. Um, because as, as I've said already, and I, I shared this, I think a few weeks ago, when, when I was in seminary, uh, my New Testament professor, when any, anytime anyone would say something like, well, Paul is saying to us, you get your paper marked up. And he would always say, no, Paul is not saying to you because he did, he wasn't writing it to you. He's writing it to whoever he would write it to. But um, so, yeah, it, it does take a lot of prayer, a lot of study uh, mm. to really know how to read it, understanding the culture when it's when it's literal, when it's figurative, so on. But some of us are really, really, I shouldn't say some of us. I am looking for lessons from the Bible. Yeah. So that that makes it a little bit different. What's a lesson and what should I focus on it as only occurring, only relevant to the time that it was written. Uh, my simple answer is read your last book. <laughs> but I would agree with that. A lot, though. I would agree. I, I think well, that I want to, I want, can I jump in please? Yes. I, I just want to say that the key is study. That studying and, and discern, uh, trying to discern God's message to us individually is perhaps what you have said that we can't just read it and, and of course i'm not even referencing the cultural context but that we know that through prayer that god answers and so as we study it study and prayer perhaps go hand in hand that you, we can't just look at a verse or a passage, hoping to get meaning out of it if we're, if we're not really connecting to the one who can give the answer. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, I think that oftentimes we read scripture and it is difficult, um, but it is the time we spend in uh, immersing into the scripture uh, to actually try to learn what it is that God is saying to us, because individually or as a group, but what is he trying to tell us through this reading? And I think we, and, and, and Gail is in my Sunday school class, as there are others, I think that's what we try to do uh, in our Sunday school lessons, is to try to dig into the scripture of uh, the lesson and try to discern what is in this lesson for us today? And, um, and I think that prayer reveals much. Absolutely. I can also add that uh, when reading, for me, what works for me when I'm reading the scripture, I always ask, I said, God, please, can you reveal whatever mysteries you have in the scripture for me as I read it today? Because that would help 
to able to decipher and it you might even get a special message you know for that scripture as it pertains to your life right yeah i think that's an important uh point because there is reading scripture to find meaning for your life and that may not be necessarily the lesson for everyone out of the text um so we can read it for you know what is God saying to me in this scripture? And then we can read it and study what is the lesson for everyone? What is the lesson for the church? What are we, what are we all supposed to take out of it? So um, yeah, I think there, there are a number of ways of reading scripture. All right, lessons from 2 Timothy. There's always been false teaching in the church today. Uh, I would say that the, the Gnostics of today are those, I, I would say, prosperity preaching and teaching. Uh, I remember a few years ago, there used to be this commercial that came on 15, nine, one of the Gospels um, channel stations saying, do you want to be one of God's next millionaires? Like, oh my that's what God. God is trying to produce, a bunch of millionaires. Uh, but there's so many prosperity teachers and teachings that I would say that's the one, um, the biggest false teaching that has entered into the church in the 21st century. Um, another lesson, the church often argues over foolish things. I think some of the church, the things that are discussed or even debated in the church are relevant, serious, uh, but a lot of it isn't. Uh, and all scripture is useful is also what we find in 2 Timothy. All right. Um, moving to announcements. Uh, Dr. Gumpsey wants to thank everyone. Uh, are we thanking Dr. Gumpsey for uh, ministry uh, as Sunday school superintendent? Uh, and he's done that. I think this is his second tenure. And uh, what often happens in the church when people uh, volunteer for something, you can sometimes get stuck in that role for decades. Uh, but we thank Dr. Gumsey for his ministry. Um, Nazarene Theological Seminary, in conjunction with St. Paul School of Theology and Central Baptist Theological Seminary, uh, there's going to be a workshop on Christian building, rethinking the work of building communities, institutions, and faith. It's gonna be held at the Paseo campus at St. James. Um, Dr. Willie James Jennings uh, will be the guest lecturer. And this is uh, sponsored by Nazarene Theological Seminary. I think you can just register, go to the Nazarene Seminary website and register if you're interested. It's on Saturday. I think it starts at 9 a.m. Ash Wednesday, so we won't have Bible study next Wednesday because it is the start of Lent. And so we're going to have um, worship on Ash Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time at Sale Campus, and I thought we were having it at the South Campus at 6, but I'll have to check on that. But if you can't or don't want to come out for worship on, uh, on Ash Wednesday, you can come by uh, the campus, either campus at 7 a.m. to receive your ashes, 11 a.m. at the South Campus, and 12 noon at the Paseo Campus, and then we'll have uh, a Linton worship experience uh, on uh, at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, there's a Linton study that uh, We'll go through Easter, March 2nd through April 17th. Uh, it is uh, Reflections on the Lord's Prayer. And uh, if you would like to be a part of uh, the Linton, one of these Linton study groups, uh, call the church office, or I think you can register on our website. Uh, but it starts next week. So you want, you want to go ahead and register this week. Pastor, do we have to register for the Wednesday night as Ash Wednesday services? Yes. Will it be uh, virtual? 
virtual at all? Yeah, well, well, it will be virtual as Are you well. Are going to stream it? Okay. Yes. Oh, so no, we won't. We will only have worship at Paseo on Lent. So not at the South Campus, just one uh, Lenten service at the Paseo Campus, 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can sign up and join, or you can uh, worship uh, virtually. Uh, noon uh, on Thursdays. Uh, there's sold out prayer and conversation. To learn more about that, you can go to our website or call the church office. And every Wednesday morning, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time, there's a short time of prayer and devotion. Call in line. Um, and the information is there as well. Every Wednesday, 7 a.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, you can connect with us on YouTube. You've not been to our YouTube page. I would encourage you to go check it out. Now, please note what makes YouTube better than Facebook is you do not have to have a YouTube account. You do not have to, to get on YouTube. You don't need an account. To get on Facebook, you have to have an account. Um, but we have a lot of uh, content up on our YouTube channel, um, sermons, prayers, interviews, all sorts of things. Uh, go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, St. James, uh, Kansas City. That is it. All right. Uh, what, what, is the, what is the reading for week after next? We're going to do the book of Titus, the letter that Paul wrote to Titus and Philemon. Philemon is just one chapter. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Pastor, I have a question. Yes. Something that occurred to me as we were studying these two books, the, the cultural versus doctrine. And I'm wondering if what we see as disharmony among Christians, that some of it stems from cultural understandings. Is that making sense? You no, absolutely. Okay, because we have, and then we want to point fingers at each other, <laughs> but that is bred within the culture of, of the particular groups, and that spills over. It's not necessarily that it's something that's even in the Bible. Yeah, I, I would um, say as I'm as I was studying for tonight, when it says women keep silent in church, um, the um, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, one one commentary even says that this is what Paul said. He didn't say that God demands that women be silent in church, because again, Paul was dealing with a specific cultural issue that was happening in Ephesus. He didn't write this uh, to the Galatians because they weren't dealing with it. It, it, it was happening in, in Ephesus. So yes, I, I do think we have to be careful. Even the issue, you know, where uh, polygamy, nowhere does it say God says marry more. I mean, what we know that God says, according to the Bible is, um, man shall leave his mother and father and become one with his wife. Um, but uh, we, we sometimes mistake the culture that was happening in biblical times from the lesson that we're supposed to learn. Well, I just uh, happened, and I'm, I'm going to end with this, I happened to stumble on to a discussion yesterday evening on um, one of the platforms, I can't remember, it was a group of women and the question about abortion. Um, and this was a question, is uh, abortion prohibited in the Bible? Um, and that is what has stemmed from much of the anger and angst, angst around abortion. Um, I'd be interested to see what text they use to talk about abortion. Yeah, the question was, is it in the Bible? So they didn't use the text. They just asked the oh. question. 
Um, I, you know, I don't know the answer, but I'm saying that's another, to me, that's another cultural driven division. Um, but the question is there, is there somewhere in the Bible that we can point to scripture where God said there shall, that abortion is not to happen? Um, I'm, I'm sure there are scripture that people would point to. Yes, I don't know them offhand. Mm -hmm. But because abortion wouldn't have been a concept that people in that day would have practiced, it would have been, right. it, you won't find it named specifically in the Bible. But I'm sure there are passages that people use. The, the pro-lifers use, I shall not kill. Right. Which continues to raise the question, what is life? And when does life begin? Right. <laughs> so it's a circular <laughs> argument, and Elm is absolutely right. That it, that becomes a really crazy kind of thing. Yeah. Well, you, many denominations have their own stance on it. Uh, the United Methodist has had the stance, same stance, for a while, and it's never really been been debated that I know of. And that you know that. The United Methodist Church is against abortion. Um, I, I think you could be against abortion, but at the same time, um, against governmental regulations on someone's body, except when it's a mandate. Uh, Absolutely, uh, vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that issue never will probably be resolved. It will always drag on through the political process. Right. I, I don't think people will agree with that because, yes, you have the argument. How can you tell me what I can do with my body? But then you have the other side. Uh, Thou shall not kill. Um, but God did sanction war. So what does it mean to kill? And most of those, uh, so many of those uh, anti-abortion, they sanction the death penalty, too. So. Um, I, I saw in the chat, for those who are on Facebook may not get it, so there was a question about a podcast. Yes, I do have a podcast with this other guy who wants to be just like me, and it's called Chopping It Up with the Cleavers. It'll, uh, the first podcast will be on March 1st on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. I mean, there's some are saying, what in the world is a podcast? Um, I can't explain it in simple words, but March 1st is when the first podcast will air. And it's not a pastoral type oh, podcast. Oh, so yes. Thank you. We'll look for that. Thank you for that. <laughs> no, it is not. <laughs> because the other guy is not a pastor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yes, no, it is not pastoral. Uh, but we'll be talking about politics, religion, current events, um, entertainment, all of that. Sports. And have some, uh, we'll even have some, some guests on there from time to time. Uh, Pastor, when you yes. said some people might not know what a po podcast is, for those over a certain age, it's a radio talk show <laughs> yes it's a, it's a radio talk show that's not on radio it's right. on a streaming service yeah so if you have spotify or wherever you can get it uh, pandora anywhere you get podcasts but it'll also be on youtube so you don't need an account to get to youtube all right um if there are no other questions no comments no Announcements, we'll go ahead and close with prayer. So we're not going to see the videos on. Um... Uh, yeah, I, I had trouble pulling them up. So I'll, I'll try to show it. Maybe we'll show it before we study Philemon and Titus, because those are real two short books. Like I said, Philemon is just one chapter. And it's a real simple chapter about uh, a, a runaway slave who goes to Paul. His name is Onesimus, and Paul sends him back to Philemon. Um, you might think Paul is a bad guy, so he's he, but he, but he's telling the the slave master Philemon, "Well, you know better. You're a Christian, so you ought not abuse your slave." So 
it's a real simple book. So we'll, we'll perhaps show it to you. Can, can we please pray for um, the situation in Ukraine and also to start praying for the upcoming elections? The time yeah. might be very far away, but it's time to just start putting it into our devotions. The time we remember. So that we can have are. majority in the in the in <laughs> no you are right yes uh we do need to play pray about our elections uh because there's a great chance of some trickery going on um mm -hmm. but yes and also the, the issue with uh russia and ukraine and the united states and uh europe's involvement in all of this so Definitely. All right, well, let's pray. Holy God, thank you for our conversation this evening. Thank you for helping us to grow and learn and help us to continue to discern your truth uh, that we might become stronger and wiser in our faith journey. We do pray for world peace as uh, there is the possibility of war in parts of the world. And uh, we pray for uh, those faithful men and women whom you have called and anointed and appointed to serve in elected office, help uh, just the election run smooth and fair. Uh, mighty God, we pray that your will be done. Thank you for this evening, and we pray that your spirit of peace and truth will rest, rule, and abide within our hearts now and forever. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, have a good evening. You all Thank have you. a good Bye. evening. Good week. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>